8, uh, verses 16 through 25, really we've hunkered down here in verse 17, and we've moved slowly into uh, this next section of information because of really the way in which the Spirit is presenting the information uh, here. Again, the Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. We just came out of that conclusion and exhortation uh, in verses 12 through 15 where Paul is exhorting us to walk after the Spirit. He's described the provision of walking after the Spirit, and the provision is made in the cross work uh, and in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, the mechanics of walking after the Spirit is the Spirit's going to teach us some things uh, for us to walk after, and the way in which we walk after is by minding them. So we need to learn them, and then we need to mind them. When we do that, uh, the fruit of that mind uh, is going to be in connection with how our bo- with our body. We're going to do things with our hands. We're going to say things with our lips. We're going to go places, uh, and and those kind of things. And so our body is involved, and there was a provision there as well for the spirit to quicken our mortal body as we mind the things of the spirit. And then he gave that final exhortation where he described that we don't owe anything to the flesh because if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. But if you through the Spirit do, mo- do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. It's through the Spirit that we ought to want to live now. And uh, that is where the true life is. That's where we can produce fruit unto holiness. That's where that functional life is. That's where the abounding of grace can be uh, experienced and it can be had. Uh, And in that context of doing something through the Spirit, we can do that now because, one, we're under grace. And the second thing is, is that under God's grace, if we're going to do something through the Spirit, that means and that implies and indicates that we're his sons and daughters. And that kind of relationship is a different kind of relationship than what Israel had under the law. God did not deal with Israel under the law as his sons and daughters in an adult relationship. He dealt with them in a childhood relationship. Now, are we the children of God? Yes. Were they the children of God? Yes. However, the kind of relationship can also be described when you're talking about how the father relates to his children. Does he relate to them as children or as adults? There, he, under the law, he dealt with them as they were his children, and he dealt with them as children. With us, we're his children, but he's dealing with us as his sons and daughters. And that is part and parcel of, uh, of how us being his sons and daughters, he's going to educate us as such. And that's where that positive response of crying, Abba, Father, comes from. It's knowing that we're not just his children and he's dealing with us as children, but we're his children and he's dealing with us as sons and daughters, as adults. And there's a whole bunch of uh, implications of that. As we went back to Proverbs and looked at what a, how a father educates his, his sons and daughters, what is it in and what does it amount to, all that is behind the cry of Abba Father, of gratitude and appreciation, of thanksgiving, of this relationship, and one of expectation of what the Father is going to bring us through. There was also implications of that most likely after verse 15, something of suffering is going to come up because the only other time that expression is used, I I believe, I'm losing my reference, but I think it's Mark 14, uh, is in Mark's gospel when Christ, at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he is going to go be persecuted and suffer on the cross, that's when he uses that expression. And lo and behold, as we've gotten now to verse 16 and 17, uh, specifically 17, suffering has come up. And, um, and after that, the Spirit's going to continue his leading, teaching ministry with us. And what he does is he's going to bear witness with our spirit. And that is he's going to testify to a truth we already know to advance our mind to the next thing he wants us uh, to understand. And he testified and he bare witness to the truth that we are children of God. We, are, we have been spiritually begotten. We, there's a spiritual conception when we heard the gospel and we received it by faith and faith alone. When we believed in our heart. Uh, that, that form of doctrine which was delivered to us, the gospel of Christ in connection with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the justification of life. And as he brings that up, that's for the sake of advancing us to understand that if we're children, then we're heirs. 
If we're children of God, we're heirs. If we're children, we're heirs. If we're children of God, then we're heirs of God. And we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that's the whole steps he wants us to take us. Here we're justified. We're children. If we're children, well, well then we're heirs. Well, if we're heirs, we're also joint heirs with Christ. And now he's, now he's got us in the context, in the realm of our inheritance, specifically in connection with Christ and what, it ha what he has. And then he brings up the next proposition. The semicolon there in verse seven, uh, 17, after joint heirs with Christ, and we talked about what we share with Christ. And then he says, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The if so be isn't attached to what was said before, the joint heirs with Christ, because the joint heirs with Christ is connected to the and that came before it, which is connected to the heirs of God. But the if so be, uh, that we, uh, if so be that we suffer with him, is connected to the next word, that. We suffer not to be a joint heir, but we suffer to be Glor to, to be glorified together with him. And that's, a different a that's another aspect to our overall inheritance. In other words, we are joint heirs with Christ at certain aspects of the inheritance, but now there's another aspect of the inheritance that we don't automatically uh, inherit. We, we have access to it. We have access to the, the qualification of participating with it, but we don't automatically have it. And suffering is involved. If that glorifying together is just the, just the issue of having his life in heaven for all eternity and a new glorified body, you don't put suffering before it. Because the way in which you get eternal life and a new body and to be with him forever in, in the heavenly places is not by suffering. It's by faith alone in the gospel of, of Christ. How that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. What brother, just, what brother Terry just prayed about before. That's how you get it. This is something else. And, and, and then you know it's something else by everything that came before it. And this isn't the same thing. And that's why when we talk about it, we're going to talk about his peculiar glory. It's a, a unique aspect of his overall inheritance. And that's what begins to get underway here in, in connection with suffering with him. Now, for the last couple of weeks, we've been going through a suffering survey. Um, suffering has a different, uh, it's not the best word to use, but it's the only one that's coming to my mind, has a different feel to it in what we commonly know as the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. And it's no different in Paul's epistles. Suffering is different because it's attached now to something different. Under the law, the suffering played a role, but it was in connection with their performance or their lack thereof. And we're going to go back and take a look at these things here in weeks to come. But suffering now is look, viewed at, looked at differently under God's grace. And so we've got to be able to distinguish the two so we can highlight the other one a little bit better. And what we've been doing is just been going through Matthew through Revelation and seeing uh, the significance specifically in Paul's epistles. But we've wrapped that up. Um, we we'll might look at one more. But to just to show how prominent of an issue this is, suffering. Right after here in Romans 8, where we're at, right after he gets done talking about walking after the Spirit, essentially the very next th major thing that he talks about is suffering. And they, they go hand in hand. Um, not always, but generally they go hand in hand. Because when you walk after the Spirit, you're not walking after the what? The flesh. And which one is common to us? The flesh, right? Which one's not common? The Spirit. And so when you're walking after the Spirit and you're bearing fruit unto holiness, what is, what is walking after the flesh? What's that fruit? Death. Yeah, death. It's, it's not holy. It's, it can't be pleasing and acceptable. But it's what's common and natural to us and to the world. And so when we walk after the Spirit, there's going to be a, re, a, a, a response to that. Again, some things are going to be well received. But there's going to be other things that are not well received. And so suffering comes into play. And that's why you have, in fact, in light of that, we'll wrap up, look at suffering in Paul's epistles uh, by coming to 
Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Timothy, chapter three. Second Timothy, chapter three, and then we're going to move into some things in, in the the general epistles or the Hebrew epistles, Hebrews of Revelation. We're going to look at a couple things there, and then we are going to move on to start introducing the this issue of being glorified together with Christ and what that means. And then we're going to move on and then we have some, some other work to do as we go on to verse 18. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, look at verse... Well, let's just start here in verse 1. He says, This know also, that in the last days, and that's in the last days of the dispensation of God's grace, perilous times shall come. It's interesting that in over in chapter 8, I'll just scroll up here on the, on the um, projector here. One of the things that he mentions when he talks about the sufferings of Christ, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or famine, excuse me, or nakedness, or peril? And now, one of the things that he does is he, he, he's going to classify the times near the end of the dispensation of grace as perilous times. From Paul, they're coming. And we're going to experience them. At least in the, the last days of the dispensation of God's grace. Verse 2. And here's some of the things. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. I love lists. Because you get to see kind of what's you get, you get to see, and you got to kind of view the list. Is it going to lesser issues to major issues? Or is it going from more significant issues to, to lesser issues? And the very first thing that he mentions is that one of the things that's going to char characterize these perilous times are men shall be lovers of their own selves. And that's the opposite of the very first feature that we're going to receive in our instruction of, of godly wisdom in Romans 12 of not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to but to think soberly. Don't think of ourselves. Don't love ourselves. But think soberly about ourselves and here what's going to characterize men is that they're going to be lovers and especially in the church be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And he, I don't know if you can see it, but he brackets it in. Verse 2, lovers of their own selves. Verse 4, at the end, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. He uses that word love there in the, the negative. He says, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Anyways, I, I, I bring that up. One of the things you have to do with this list is you have to see that, well, we all have parts of this in us. And we all we always will will do something. This is a this is a a heavy dosage that's going to be experienced in the last days of these things. There's always at times where we can love ourselves, especially more than more than others. But this these are the things that are going to characterize uh, the church. They're going to have a heavy dose. So that's some of the context here. And Paul keeps going on. He says, from such, turn away. In fact, in verse, chapter 2, verse 26, he talked about how the servant of the Lord must not strive. Verse 24, and be gentle, all the men apt to teach, patient, uh, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God prevention will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who shall be taken captive by him at his will. There's going to be some who are in captivity to Satan in his will. And then he describes what that's going to look like. And then he says from, uh, and then there's some that you, you such turn away. And, and you got to be, uh, when you do deal with them, you got to deal with them this way. And then he 
describes them a little bit more as he goes on in verse 6 of chapter 3. He says, For of this sort are they which creep in the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust. That, that silly women um, is not just women, by the way. Uh, he's, he's using some terminology here to, to describe, again, a, uh, this group of people. Um, in fact, you go back and look at some of the, uh, like Charles Dickens, and he'll use that expression, uh, silly women. Uh, and he's using it really for, um, I forget which book it was. Um, it might be Charles Dickens. Yeah, Charles Dickens. There was another one too. Uh, but he's describing uh, guys on a ship and how they're acting like silly women. And so he's used, he's, that's the same way it's kind of being used here. It says, led away with diverse lust. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Led. Led away. Instead, we're to be led of the Spirit, led by the Spirit. And here, they're being led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jannies and Jambres with, with, uh, with, now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. And now look at what Paul's going to say here in verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long what? Suffering, charity, what? Patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I, what? Endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Two things I want you to see is that here, when he describes the, he, he, he kind of goes into these issues of, of you're going to receive negative feedback, but the servant of the Lord must not strive. That's chapter 2. And then he talks about perilous times shall come and the effects of that and who's going to be involved in that. And then he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine of verse 10 of chapter 3. So the remedy against those things is his doctrine. And when one is a lover of their own selves, that means that that's not really good for someone else. And all those things, traitors and, and truce breakers and uh, fierce, despisers, heady, lovers of pleasure, uh, disobedience is involved, the proud, blasphemers, all of that indicates and denotes that there's going to be opposition to those who are involved in those things. Being in the perilous times, experiencing the peril of all these things come, come against one, and experience it, and Paul's saying, but thou hast known my doctrine, and you have known my persecutions, my afflictions, and how I endured them. And then he concludes it in one sense by saying, verse 12, yea, and all that are in Christ shall suffer persecution. Yeah, yeah. All, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And that's why I wanted you to see in connection with Romans 8. He got done talking about walking after the Spirit. Walking. Producing fruit. And then the next major issue is suffering. And because they go ahead. When you become saved, you don't automatically live godly. It doesn't happen that way. You have to will to live godly. In other words, you have to live, you, you have to learn what godliness is. And then you've got to align your will, not to the flesh, not to the world, not to these folks, not to uh, those that are like Jannies and John Brady. You have to align your will with the godliness. And if the godliness says think one way, well, you, you'll want to, want to think one way. And do something one way, do something one way. And so on and so on. And he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We've learned in Romans 5 and 6 that we're in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, how to live, 
how to walk in Christ Jesus. If you do it through the, uh, uh, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. Ye shall what? Live. Living is, is, is synonymous with walking after the Spirit. And all that's done in Christ. And if you do that in Christ, ye shall suffer persecution. So the pattern, and that's why I want you to see the pattern is there. The doctrinal flow of Romans, in Christ, live, walk, suffer. Same thing here. It's just in a different way, but it's, it's, you break it down, it's the same order. You've got to be in Christ to be able to live godly in Christ, and you're going to suffer persecution. Okay, so that's the, that's the pattern. Well, let's move over now to those, those general epistles. And I want you to see that this isn't unique to Paul's epistles. In fact, we've already looked at some passages in, uh, in the gospel accounts. In fact, I'm going get, to get one with me. Look at Romans 5, uh, sorry, not Romans, Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, and then we'll head over to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Matthew 5, and there's one other thing that we want to add to this pattern. I want you to see, we're not adding it, we're just noticing it, but as far as getting it in our minds right now, adding it. In Christ, live, walk, godly, suffer, glory. That's how it goes. Four things. In Christ, live, walk, godly, uh, suffer, Reward, glory. And watch it here too. Matthew 5. Look at, uh, well, just pick it up here in verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are, oh, here it is. So he's talking about their, their walk, their conduct and behavior. Blessed are the meek, blessed are they that mourn, that poor in spirit, and all that produces some, a certain conduct and behavior. Now look at verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So what are they involved in? In their walk. Unrighteousness or what? Righteousness. righteousness. They're going to be persecuted on the basis of righteousness' sake. If they're not uh, participating in right, uh, righteousness, they're involved in unrighteousness. doesn't mean you can't suffer for unrighteousness. It happens all the time, every single day. But unrighteousness, then the suffering isn't going to amount to what he says here. He says, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for what? For my sake. And he says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why do you want to be glad when you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake? Well, he's going to give you the reason why you're exceeding, not just glad, but exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the reason why, as you participate in the righteousness and, and, and suffer for his name and his sake and his, and his name's sake and in righteousness' sake, the reason why in that you can ex be exceeding glad is it not, it's not right there that because you have eternal life. It's because there's a reward. In fact, he gives a measure to that reward. He says, great. Great is your reward in heaven. That's why you're, that's why you're not just glad. Maybe you would be glad if you had a reward in heaven. But you're exceeding glad because great is your reward because you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake. So it's, it's in Christ, do things for his name, live, walk, do things in connection with righteousness' sake, suffer persecution, reward glory. Now I want you to see that elsewhere. Look at Hebrews 11. And the testimony of Scripture is plain and clear on that. In that order, all throughout. In fact, he even brings up the prophets of the prophets of old. That they came along and they spoke the word of God. They got negative feedback. Most of them were killed. And they did that in connection with great. A great and we'll see this here. Because in Hebrews 11, this is that hall of faith that goes back and looks at certain individuals... And look at what it's going to say in connection with them. 
Let's just pick it up here in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And that's what the Lord's establishing there. You're, you're, you're involved in something and you're, you're suffering for it and you're doing it for something you can't see. And you're, that's, that's why it's by faith. You're doing it for something you can't see and that's why it, it's, it's of faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. He's telling them to hope for that reward. And part of that is go through, participate in the righteousness, suffer for it, and in that hope for what's to the, what's the, what's the come? Glory. The glory. It says the evidence of things not seen. And all that they have for the evidence of things not seen of that great reward is the faith they have in the present. In the sufferings. Verse 2. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Now jump down with me to verse... Uh, look at verse, look at verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was what? Righteous. Righteous. He, was, he was justified. He was justified... And the fact that he offered the right sacrifice, that was his walking, his living, okay? So he, by that, when you go back and look at that small account of Genesis 4 of Cain and Abel, one of the things that you know that, that Abel was justified is because he offered the, the more excellent sacrifice. Abel didn't offer a right sacrifice, and it, and it was our, that's the, all the indication we have of that small account that he wasn't justified. And so he comes along and says that, he's obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now look at what he's going to conclude, he's going to bring up Enoch now too, and then he's going to give a little... A little conclusion like in verse 6. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he what? Please God. Well how do we know what does that mean? What does that, what does that indicate? Verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a what? A rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. And that's what you're essentially doing. Now, I, I, there is a difference. I'm just trying to show you a, a, the parallel and the thread throughout the New Testament, really throughout all the scripture, but the thread of those that walk after him, diligently seek after him, there's going to be a response to that and then, the, and then a reward. Um, now jump over with me to verse 23. And let's look at Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to what? Suffer, Suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So what he does, Moses has two options in front. Moses is put in a unique situation. You don't know the situation he's put in. He's got a unique situation. Stay with the Egyptians, grow up under their system, and, and, and enjoy the pleasures of, as, as, as described here, the pleasures of sin. Or he can refuse to be called a son of, of Pharaoh and do what he did, and that is to participate with the people of God. But if you do that, you're going to suffer. It's, it's, a, it's a natural consequence when you associate yourself with the Hebrews under their Egyptian rule, especially during that time. And he chose, get that, he chose it. 
He decided, I'm not doing this, I'm going to do this. And look at what's behind his choice. Verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, that was going to be the role he played, greater, what? Riches than the treasures in Egypt. Why? Why did he do that? For he had respect. He highly esteemed and valued the issue of unto the recompense of what? The reward. Moses knew back then that his choice was going to produce something later on. He made a choice. Don't go after the pleasures of sin with the Egyptians. Choose to go with the people of God and suffer affliction. And the reason why he did that is because he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater treasure than all the treasures of Egypt. And, for, and he, had, he had respect. I love that word. He respected that God would recompense to him a reward. Doesn't stop there. There's just a, it just is followed up by a whole bunch. Jump down with me to uh, verse 32. He 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 talks more with 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 Moses and, uh, and Rahab, and then he starts listing a whole bunch off. Verse 32. And what shall I more say? And, and he gets to this point where he comes along and says, I, how, I, I can bring up so many more examples of this. And the reason why people of old chose to do a certain action instead of the alternative because they have the same respect unto the recompense of reward. What shall, what, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah. Those are in the judges. Of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And what you have there is that as they did a certain action, they, had, they got certain provisions in the life that now is. Well, their life. But look what else it says. Verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured. But they had a choice not to be tortured. Not accepting deliverance. Well, why in the world would you not accept deliverance from torture? That they might obtain the resurrection from the dead. It's not what it says. A better resurrection. That means they're already going to be raised from the dead. They already knew that. Daniel knew that. Job isn't mentioning He knew his Redeemer liveth. David knew that. A lot of, they knew that they were going to be raised from the dead. But why they're doing what they're doing during their lives is not to be raised from the dead. It's that they might obtain a better resurrection. So it had implications in the present time. Daniel, the mouths of the lions were stopped. His three friends, when they were thrown in the fire, they weren't, uh, that the, 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 it was quenched, quenched the violence of fire. Some escaped the edges. They, they had provision in the, in the present, but not only that, they're also looking for a, not just the resurrection, but a better resurrection. And that's exactly when you follow it through, the Lord explains that when he comes, his work is before him and his reward follow after him. And when he, sit, when he comes down, he's going to judge his own people first. And he is going to judge them based upon what they did with, with what he's given them. And he'll reward them. And some he won't. Verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, uh, scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. But they were worthy of another world. 
the world that is to come. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith. That issue of a good report has nothing to do with justification unto eternal life. It has everything to do with the reward. A better resurrection, that concept. Good report through faith. Receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Now look at chapter 12 verse 1. Now the writer of Hebrews just got done with all that and he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The witnesses of old, they're compassed about them. They're a part of all this. And now he's going to charge them and exhort them. He says, let us lay aside every weight. Everything that is going to hinder them to making choices like Moses and David and, 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 and Jephthah and Barak and Samson and, and uh, Daniel and those, those, those guys. Moses did that. Moses had a great weight of those treasures of Egypt. And he laid it aside. And the sin which doth so easily beset us. We won't talk about that right now. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto, and here's the, the final one. Jesus. The author of and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That's some of the, the weight that they have to lay aside is the shame of making a choice like Moses, the shame of making uh, 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 decisions like those witnesses of old. They got to lay, lay aside that. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He doesn't say, endure the cross, despise and the shame, and, is, uh, and, ha and now has eternal life. That's not the focus. The focus is something in that life. And it's a position of authority. Set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto what? What, is he, what, is, what does that mean? <clears throat> Ye have not yet resisted unto blood. <clears throat> well, we know Christ died, right? That's what he says. He says, Ye have not yet. Mm -hmm. So, what is the writer of Hebrews essentially calling them unto? Resist all that stuff, even if you are going to die. Now, do they have to do that? No. They don't have to. In fact, the indication, in back up in chapter 11, when it says, verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. The implication is some were tortured and they accepted deliverance. But the ones being mentioned here are the ones that didn't accept deliverance, for the purpose that they might obtain a better resurrection. And this is what he's explaining. But the glory, but the, that's what he's going to, the focus on is the, is the glory. You can resist unto blood, you can die. And that's what happened to Christ and many of the other ones b before. But the glory outweighs the, the, the dying. Well, Let's go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Let's see this a couple more times here. And then we'll hit one in Revelation and then we'll move on. 1 Peter. We've been here a few times, but I'll just go over it again here quick. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. They have that. They have something that's already reserved in heaven for them. 
who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So there's something reserved in heaven for them. And right at this point, they're being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That salvation is a, is a physical salvation in the last time. Being able to live and go through that, that kingdom is going to fit perfectly after the dispensation of the grace of God. It's not salvation from the debt and penalty of their sins. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Isn't that interesting? He's, he's just described that they, they have something reserved in heaven. They have an incorruptible inheritance. And then he moves right away into trials and temptations. It says, wherein greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in, in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the response is, greatly rejoice. He's echoing that of Matthew 5. Be exceedingly glad when ye are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For great is your reward in heaven. Peter was there. He was listening. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. The very same, very same way of looking at things that, than, that we just read in Hebrews 11 with Moses. He, didn't, he esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater than the treasures of Egypt. For he had a, he had a, recomp he had a respect unto the re recompense of reward. And that's what Peter's talking about here. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, there you have glory in connection with their undefiled, uh, fading not away, reserved in heaven, incorruptible inheritance that's in heaven. This is something different. This is another aspect that the trying of their, their faith, their faith is is doing essentially three things. At first, their faith in uh, what, was, what was taught to them has begotten them again. That's one. The second thing it's doing, it's keeping them. The power of God in their faith is keeping them unto salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. That's their, essentially their conduct and behavior. They have to endure until the end and then they'll be saved, they, they taught. If they don't, by faith, trust in the words of what Christ taught them and what you read in the Hebrews Revelation out here, they can die. They're still going to be resurrected in that kingdom, but th this, this is what they're looking for. This is, their, this is their hope to get to that point and be saved and physically walk through it and, and be like Enoch and not even taste death. And that's what they look for. So they're being kept by the power of God and through faith until this last time. And the third thing is that their faith is being tried. However, the trying of their faith can be found unto praise, honor, and glory, glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ when he comes back. So it's doing essentially three things. He says verse 8. So again, you have the issue of they're, they're in Christ, they're begotten again. There's a, there's, a, there's a walk. There's a, a walk by faith. There, and then there's trials to that. And then he says, go through all that and the trying of it is, can be found in the praise, honor, and glory. That's the reward issue. Verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That, and, and, and the full of glory is their inheritance that they have and the issue of tr the trying of my faith. And we're going to see something a little bit later on here in First Peter. He talks about the spirit of glory resting upon them. And we'll see that. The, the, the issue of looking for that reward that's attached to their hope. And that's what makes up them being full of glory. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. That, that grace is that recompense of reward. That all the prophets, and those we just read in Hebrews 11, were looking forward to, and the prophets would look forward to, of that grace that should come unto, unto them. 
The, the, the unique privilege that this generation has out here is not being resurrected into the kingdom and then getting the reward then. It's actually walking into it and, and getting the reward. There's a difference. This is, this is how they viewed things. Um, but these prophets, verse 13, that prophesy the grace that should come on to you, verse, uh, verse 11, excuse me, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the what? glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister to things it's interesting because the sufferings of Christ you think the prophets are talking about what he went through and the glory that he's going he's to experience but that's really not what he's talking about because he's saying the things that the prophets were prophet the prophets didn't do that you have Isaiah 53 and a lot of other passages that talk about how he's going to suffer and then there's glory to follow for him. But that's not what he's mentioning here. Because the things that he's talking about here that the prophets prophesied unto, they were ministering unto what? The Lord? No, unto us. And so the sufferings of Christ are what follow the cross in his resurrection and ascension. Here's the sufferings of Christ. When they adhere to his teaching, there's going to be a response, a negative response to that. He prepares them for that. Great is your reward. Okay? And those prophets prophesy things. So you can find this. We've been looking at the New Testament. You can find this back in the Old Testament. But when it's found back in the Old Testament, it's ministering to this group of people here. That's whom they're talking about. And he says, verse 12, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, not unto the prophets here, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. There you go. The gospel of the kingdom with the Holy Ghost. That makes it us. Okay, That's what's uh, qualifying the us. Sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. And that's because the angels are going to play a role out here. And then he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that shall be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know what that is. That's, that's revelation. He says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he hath called you, uh, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who with without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in what? Fear. Fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed, there are ye redeemed, with corruptible things as silver and gold, for your vain conversation, uh, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Notice that. Raised him from the dead is not necessarily the glory here. He raised him from the dead and gave him glory. That your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now, I just wanted to show you essentially that whole chapter because he's talking about that same thread we're looking at. They've, begotten, they've been begotten again. They ha are redeemed. They, are, uh, they have purified their souls. They're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, the gospel, the kingdom that was preached to them, and those kind of things. And there's going to be a response to that. That's why you have to gird up the loins, loins of your mind. You're going to go through some things and put, some, uh, put, a, put your... your, your uh, that, that, that girding up the loins of your mind and, and, and that sobriety of thinking and hope. And that hope is going to provide them some endurance and it's a hope of not only resurrection, but it's the hope of the recompense of reward. 
that their faith might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing, or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, First Peter, Peter talks about this all over the place in his, in his first epistle. Look at, uh, look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, and let's pick it up here in verse 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, Fear God, that's that positive fear, that it was in chapter 1 there when we read it in verse 17, that's that positive fear as well. <clears throat> Honor the king. That's an amazing statement, by the way. Because there's going to be a king out here. And to the level and capacity they can, they're told to honor him. Do you know who that guy is? They call him the Antichrist. Tells you how God looks at government, by the way. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. This is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Did you get that? This is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God, because of his conscience and what's been built up in his conscience of that sobriety of thinking, and it's toward God, if he endures grief, suffering wrongfully, that's to be thankworthy. W why is it thankworthy? Verse 20. For what, what is it? For what glory is it? If, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Because that's who he is. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, walk after him, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself. Notice that. He committed. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And so again, the issue is commit yourself to him that judges righteously. You're going to participate in some conduct and behavior. And when you're reviled and when you're persecuted, don't take the natural reaction. Because that's not acceptable. What's acceptable is, is how he reacts to it. Look at chapter 3. Now again, I, I hope you know, this, this, is, this is for out here. But I'm just trying to show you the, the similar thread and pattern, okay? Uh, look at verse... Look at verse 11. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's specific to out here. Uh, the, the apostate element of Israel, though you're going to keep praying unto God, but God has closed his ears to him, to them. But the remnant, he, his ears are open, and especially the faithful remnant. Verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. 
For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And then he goes on to, to describe some other things. And look at one more with me, and then we'll, we'll end our first session. Look at chapter 4, look at verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Isn't that often how we view trials? Man, this is, why, why is this going on? So, so strange and foreign to us. And the scriptures teach us, get used to it. Not that way, but get used to it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in two ways when we go back to Romans. The sufferings of this present time. And if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to participate in the sufferings of Christ. And it's going to happen. So it not be a strange thing. And it's the same thing for him out here. In fact, they have a more lengthier testimony of prophecies that describe this time. And so they're not to think it's strange. Verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. Now get this, because this, this is the same parallel issue. Is his glory revealed yet? No, his glory is going to be revealed. So is he, is he glorified right now in the sense that it's being spoken about here? No. And so he's saying you're going to participate in, this, in Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall re be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. When his glory is re be revealed, you'll be exceeding glad out there. Why do you think that is? Because you're going to share in that glory with him but they're attached to the sufferings. Verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Why? For the spirit, the mind, essential frame of mind of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And that's why that when you're suffering for well-doing and you're participating in Christ's sufferings, you're going to be exceeding glad out there. Why? Because in that, you're glorifying Him and He's going to recompense you for that with glory, sharing in that glory. And over and over and over from beginning to end in this beautiful, beautiful book, you, you see Him getting the mind and the intention always on the glory that's to come. It's going to be worth it. Just hold on. Endure. Endure. Hold on. The glory is greater. The glory is greater. Think about that. Get your mind stayed on that. Song of Solomon. When the woman there is, the, the Shulite woman there is waiting for her lover to return. It's a type of the remnant waiting for Christ to return. It's all about thinking about what it's going to be like when I see him. What is it going to be like when, when he takes me to his, his home? And the love that we're going to share, and there's that intimacy of relationship that's, that's described, of the, the enjoyment and the gladness that's, that's going to be experienced out there. And it's just thinking about that, because when you think about that, the things of life will grow strangely dim, as the hymn says. It's walking by faith in these trials. Going through intense pain, hurt, distress, opposition, affliction. But yet, what's going on inwardly is, is a rejoicing, a gladness, because this is just working for you. This is just working for you. You're looking now at sufferings completely differently, and it works. It's one of the greatest aspects of God's power to get into your heart, to get into your mind, and think about something else when something is so real, so prevalent, so experienced, and, and you're thinking about something else that you're enduring it. You're, and there's some strength there. And, and you're patiently enduring it because you just you know that hope is going to be so worth it. And when you do that, you'll be counted worthy of his kingdom. Well, we'll stop there and we'll 
we'll get the last one in Revelation in the next session. And then we're going to move on to looking at a little more of this glory and what this is all about uh, in the life that is to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word and see the, at least from Matthew to Revelation, we'll wrap it up in the next session, to see this thread of this pattern of being justified. It's described a little bit differently in the different programs. But the general concept is there, being justified, an exhortation to, to live godly in those unique times, a negative response, most likely and usually uh, resulting from that godly living, a certain attitude in that of being glad, and the reason why that can be there is not because of something that we can conjure up on our own but that to have a, a respect of the, the recompense of reward. And so, Father, we thank you that you have provided this. Not only, not only have you, through the, the, the cross work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, have provided us the free gift of eternal life that we have received by faith and faith alone, but because we're your children and heirs and joint heirs with Christ, we have access to this other aspect of the inheritance that we can suffer with him. And the reason why anyone would want to do that is because they want to please you. They want to live godly, face the, the consequences of that, and have their mind fixed on the glory that will follow. What a privilege. And may, as Peter says, May that spirit of glory, that mindset, become a, a vital element and principle in the midst of our heart. That it is something that we think about all the live long day. And that we uh, exercise, especially when we're going through the hard times, sufferings of this present time, or in a negative response to our, our taking your word and proving it in the details of our lives. We thank you for all that you've given us in Christ and for all the provisions you have and you hold out for us and that we can yield, um, that we can yield ourselves unto and have them yield the, the fruit and the power and the glory uh, that, that comes from it. We do pray, Father, if there's someone here listening, if they've not trusted how that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again. As always, we hope and pray that they believe that wonderful news this very, this very moment. Because there's no escape from the debt and penalty of their sins in and of themselves. But Christ died for them. And if they believe that, they'll be justified unto eternal life, having all their sins forgiven, past, present, future, your righteousness imputed unto them, and they'll possess immediately upon faith and faith alone in that beautiful message, the free gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. And we thank you for this time of grace giving. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.